I worked with Sekhmet for 13 months after she'd already been helping me for a previous 13 months. What do you need, babe? Come on. Yeah? Is this worth interrupting filming for? Do you wanna sit down and be quiet? Initially, two years ago, I asked for her to help with a banishing return to sender spell, which worked. So, I spent the next 13 months offering gratitude. Well, I thought that's what I'd be doing, but Sekhmet had her own plans. Hi folks, it's Cypress. Welcome back to the wild. If you want to see what I was doing two years ago that started this all off, I'll link the playlist below. And timestamps are below if you want to jump around. But let's start with a quick recap of who Sekhmet is. Sekhmet is an Egyptian deity of war, destruction, and healing and has become somewhat conjoined with Bastet and Hathor. They have this complicated triple goddess situation, all of them possessing different forms of motherly love, among many other attributes. There's a lot more to their interrelation, but that's out of my depth. I've only ever had an armchair interest in the Egyptian pantheon, but as I mentioned, Sekhmet decides things, and two years ago, she showed up hovering over my shoulder, ready to get to work with me. I wasn't gonna argue. There's not a lot of information I was able to find on Sekhmet outside of the one extant story about her origins. I'll paraphrase loosely. Ra, the sun god, is having a time of it because humans are miserable little monsters and have rebelled against him. To punish them, he creates Sekhmet, perhaps as a really pissed off 2.0 version of Hathor, and sends her to wreak havoc on the wicked mortals. Now, Sekhmet has all the fury of a lioness defending her cubs. As well, she's the source of the sun's strength. She descends on earth and starts tearing humans apart, voraciously slaughtering so many people so fast that she has just about killed all of humanity. It's so gruesome, even Ra's rage is softened, and he compassionately rescinds his command for destruction. Only, Sekhmet has gone full carnage frenzy. She's out of her mind with bloodlust. Thinking quickly, Ra mixes barge loads of beer with something red, accounts vary, and floods the streets with this dark red beer. Allegedly, Sekhmet mistakes the beer for blood, sucks it down, and falls into a drunken slumber, then later wakes up less furious and calmly returns to Ra. Yeah, I have questions. Like, how dumb did the ancient scribes think Sekhmet was? I don't care how enraged you are, you can tell the difference between blood and beer. So, I'm assuming there's a lot of context lost over time, but also what we see here is the sort of patchworking that happens when the older mythologies won't die. But you want to push your new guy. The Babylonian creation myths are a good example of this, with Marduk, the new god, coming in and killing the dragon, or the Earth Mother. Only he can't, ultimately, because he's a little upstart and she's the goddess of all creation. And so he has to reify his victory every single year in a big ceremony. So what I think is going on is that Sekhmet is a version or descendant of this original great mother goddess. Her association with the lioness is strong evidence for this. I'll spare you the details, but think Sybil of Chattelhuyuk. So before the ancient Egypt that we know of, Sekhmet was the deity. The preponderance of lioness sculptures they've dug up hints tantalizingly at this possibility. But as happened basically everywhere after the younger Dryas, older goddesses were replaced with warrior gods, usually a sky god. But nobody in those societies actually wanted to give up their goddesses, and these deities end up subsumed into lesser roles in the new mythology. Like Inanna's position as a daughter of Enlil, the god of wisdom and sister of Shamash, 
the sun god. So I think we should take the surviving story of Sekhmet with the grain of salt. It's a historical document from a period of time long after Sekhmet's origins that tells us more about how people of that time were navigating their beliefs than who Sekhmet was originally. But now, that really doesn't leave us with much information on this goddess. We know from the proliferation of her statues that she was very important in ancient Egypt. But I'm certainly not versed on what all other information is available from that period. And modern New Age interpretations are all across the board. The materials I encountered over the last two years are mostly alien origins stuff, or a bunch of light language. And for me, that's a bridge too far. I mean, I think there's a galactic community out there, but like, don't make aliens into a religion. So, mostly, what I had to go on was Sekhmet herself, and I found her to be much more patient and warm than I would have expected her to be. Okay, let's get into it. I started in week one mixing up a cranberry and pomegranate spice tea to honor her. I understand this goddess detests waste, so a lot of what I chose to throw in there were older ingredients that might otherwise get thrown out. Also, in remembrance of that red beer, red beverages are sort of her thing now. Honestly, I think wine or a red juice would do for most tributes. And I started trying to learn more about Sekhmet, but as I said, I ran into difficulty finding credible information. Relevant to my interests, I learned that she is associated with rebirth and coming into one's own power. But Sekhmet had her own agenda for our time together, it turned out. I very quickly fell into a pattern of meditating on her to invite her in, and she just directed the interaction, teaching me a meditation using her solar fire. Not speaking words, but showing me through eye contact and my mind's eye. She would show me, in images, what she wished to do and then wait for consent. Which I would give, of course. But why is a friggin' goddess so much more polite than most men I've dated? Yeah, that's the tea, all right. Anyway, that she waited for confirmation from me for each new step was fascinating. She started by simply sharing her heart flame with me, connecting her heart to my heart, and at first, it was a lot just to receive this energy. Apparently, I had some energetic clogs, but Sekhmet wanted me to get my heart center in shape. In retrospect, that makes a lot of sense because the programming I got from early childhood forced me to shut it all down. Not my ability to love, just my ability to stand in my own strength. The parts of the heart that are connected with the solar plexus or the ability to act from our own will. So a lot of working with Sekhmet, especially early on, was learning to bypass the network of anxieties I have that keep me good and behaving. Because as much work as I've done with that, it was still a clogged and clotted mess. On week eight, I asked Sekhmet for a dream. Like, maybe I could get some answers that way. Because as communicative as this goddess was with body language, she really wasn't speaking, like, with words. Well, I dreamed that I slipped into another world, or dimension, that wasn't so plagued with all the bad, the yuck humans are embroiled in. And I was tasked in the dream with protecting an egg, hatching a magical girl child. Yeah, the symbolism isn't subtle. Then the dream shifted. I saw myself as if I'd been born into this other world and discovered that most of my issues were not anymore. I didn't have any 
of my current problems. The dream was reassuring to me because it showed me the possibility that I am not what I have struggled with. I don't have to accept an identity for myself that includes all the woundings I've received. Maybe that's not a terribly profound idea, but I haven't received a lot of reassurances in my life, and it felt good to see myself as not an accumulation of every trial and cruelty I've ever gone through. By week 14, I had the foundation of the meditation down. I would ground, then let the fire in my heart rev up. Meaning, I imagined I had vents, like on a wood-burning stove, that I could open up and let more air in to make that fire rage. The heat and flame of this internal fire could then travel down my arms and out my hands for me to wield. And this whole process, over time, was resetting me so that I could have better control over my life. I kept repeating this meditation every week. Then, at week 18, Sekhmet leveled it up, having me bring that fire up through my crown. I'm pretty sure she gave me a third eye attunement to recalibrate my capacity for intuition and wisdom. I have no idea if the wisdom is showing at all yet, but my intuition has been a lot more on point. As I got so I could hold the whole fire up through my crown to her satisfaction, Sekhmet would envelop me during the meditation, like absorb me into her or have me absorb her, something like that. Is this weird? This is weird, but I have to report what happened. What I felt it meant was like, walk with my power until it becomes yours too. She doubled down on this on week 25 and called me to live more confidently. After musing on this, I realized I had no idea how. I had no point of reference. She reminded me that I've lived many other lifetimes where this wasn't an issue and I could draw on that. Oh, yeah, LOL. We continued like this for a while. I imagine Sekhmet wanted me to have a sort of muscle memory built up for standing in her power so I could stand in mine. And I suppose I was feeling more confident and very grateful. So much so that on week 38, I offered myself as her servant and claimed her as one of my own deities as a version or embodiment of the Great Mother. And then it got a little trippy. She showed me Egypt before the Younger Dryas. I'm not sure where exactly, but near the sea. It was lush. Like, not from the Nile flooding, like there was regular rainfall. I was at a distance from a great city, and I could see all of it in one glance. It was beautiful, like a white city. Not gray, like cement. And the sky was a weird color, but very pretty. It was probably a sunset making that color. I was filled with joy at seeing this clean, gorgeous city. A city, her city, at its peak glory before the world was destroyed. But I had no frame of reference, so I asked her, why are you showing me this? It was probably the only time in those 13 months she communicated with actual words and she answered, because this is your world and will be again. At the time, I didn't really get what that meant, but it felt amazing anyway. And I'm still not 100% sure I get it. I think Sekhmet was showing me a time in our prehistory when humans had it right, or a lot more right than we do now. I believe she was showing me what our world will become many generations from now, and that the work we're doing, the struggles so many of us have as we ache to make this world a better place, that struggle isn't futile although we won't see its fruition in this lifetime. After that, I continued my weekly meditations, sometimes branching out and following a guided meditation for Sekhmet on YouTube. That is, when I could find one that wasn't just weirdly out there. Ultimately, I closed the year in celebration and gratitude, and I believe that Sekhmet will continue watching out for me, assisting me in my path of growth and ownership over my life. I've still got a ways to go. I'm not sure anyone who knows me would argue that I'm well-adjusted and ready for action, but who is, really? So, 
That is my 13 months with Sekhmet. I don't know how this compares to anyone else's experiences with her, but I thought it was pretty fan freaking tastic to experience working so closely with a deity. It's changed me, and I'm fairly certain it will continue to. So, all gratitude to Sekhmet, destroyer of all that is wrong. Wild things, I'll see you in the next video. Until then, keep your deity worship wild. The Babylonian